wealthy experts, where we are bringing on experts in their field to help us build effectively a wealthy life. Welcome everybody to another episode of Wealthy Experts. And on this episode, I got to sit down and chat with Andrew Hoyne. Now, Andrew runs a business called Hoyne and they've been doing that for 30 years. Now, Hoyne is an excellent brand and business has been helping the marketing industry push the envelope for many, many years. They are one of the leading experts in placemaking. In fact, Andrew wrote two books going on to his third now and works with all of the industry's leading property brands. Stay all the way through to the end. We chat some of his favorite books, his wealth creation tips, as well as things that you should be taking out of this property market. I especially enjoyed this episode. It's one that I'll be going back to rewatch again. So have a great time. One of my favorite things in life outside of being with my family and working and, you know, all the standard stuff, your friends, is actually listening to podcasts. I fucking love podcasts so much. It's like my number one form of... See, I don't know the difference between entertainment and education. For me, it's the same thing. Um, and so I just, you know, I walk to work every day, have done for 30 years I've been in business. And um, it's generally about a 30-minute walk to work. And I really enjoy that time on my own. I really enjoy walking. I enjoy going a different way to work every day. Like for me, that's part of exploration of my neighbourhood. But it's also, it's a reminder to me, that don't get in a rut. Don't do the same thing every day. That's really going to send you down the wrong path. So, you know, metaphorically or physically. And so I like going a different way to work every day, even if it's sometimes it might take me 10 minutes longer because I'll look at some houses or some neighbourhoods or some parks that I might not have seen recently. And um, I, for me, it's about constant observation. Um, and so in doing that, I get to listen to a different podcast every day because most podcasts go for about 30 minutes. So it's a good kind of uh, symbiotic uh, th- sort of thing to do. And I, I'm constantly saying to people, you know, when you meet up, they go, oh, you got to try this great bottle of wine or you got to go to this new restaurant. I'm the guy who goes, you got to listen to this podcast. you got to read this book. And to the point that I've got certain books that I like them so much that literally I buy boxes of them. Like I the week. Sorry? Is that Carol DeWick's grit? It, it's, uh, sorry, it's Angela Duckworth. Angela Duckworth, excuse me. Carol DeWick is growth oh. mindset. Angela Duckworth, yes. Ray Pretty Dalio. Cool. Ray Dalio, right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Honestly, I've got, I've got stacks of 20 or 30 copies of 10 different books. Uh, in fact, there's one book that I buy. When I buy it, I usually order about 30 or 40 copies at a time because I go through so many. I'm just constantly giving them to people. You know, young people that have just graduated or in school, you've got to read this. It's, 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 it's a great lesson on how you need to think about what's important to you in your life. And it doesn't matter whether you're 18 or 80, you know, some of those lessons or those, you know, th- those drivers into thinking about what's important to you are the same. So Absolutely. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself because we haven't no, even started the podcast we, yet. We, we've started. We've started. <laughs> decided. This is how we're going to start the show. Because everything you said there resonates with me. And I don't know where you picked up this idea of walking to work and taking a different path every day. I I do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I I make an effort to just know every street, to see every house and look at it from a different angle. I can't tolerate walking one way and then coming back the same way. I want to see everything from a different angle. And you can walk the same street every single day and live this this way or you can go you know six different ways and a hundred different loops and use your downtime you know that monotonous sort of walk to take in so much you know from podcasts to audiobooks to you know i I sat i sit with my um my, my fiance and she goes oh dom you've got a lot of you know quotes that you pick up along the way and she goes, where are all these books? And the problem is like you, I hand them out. Once I'm done, I'm like, it's yours. It's yours. It's yours. Because I feel like knowledge is, is great when used and shared and you can have, I feel like I digest it when I talk about it and I, and I challenge it and I, and I work with it, if that makes sense. Yeah, having conversations about a book uh, enables you to articulate the things that were most important to you when you consumed it, but also 
I have a tendency to have certain books that I might read again every second or third year. And my wife laughs at me. She's like, I know you've read that book. I'm like, yeah, but I haven't learned it. Or, I ha- yeah. or, I've, or I've implemented some of the kind of, you know, outtakes and I've forgotten some or I haven't learned all of them. And then there'll be a point I'll read it and go, I've got this covered. I'm never going to read it ever again. Um, but I just v- believe that you can read a book. You know, it's not, we're not at high school. It's not like it's a tick boxing, sorry, a box ticking exercise. When you read a book, like you want to get as much out of it as you can. It's very difficult to do that in one reading, you know, because certain things will stick out. It's only on the second or the third reading, whether it's a week later or five years later, that you'll pick up the nuances that you didn't pick up the first time. Yeah, you really need to distill that information. It needs, to, it needs to come second nature before you actually apply it properly. That's absolutely true. I've found myself learning things and thinking, wow, that's a game changer. And then looking back on my life and realizing it took me a few years to actually truly implement it. So, Andrew, I mean, you and I, we've just kicked it off and a lot of people are probably going to think, well, how do we get here? And, and who is this, this Andrew Hoyne character? Um, you and I, we've known each other for a long time and we've been um, sort of swimming in the same circles, working with similar, similar sort of parties. Your business has been tremendous to watch grow. You work with a lot of Australia's leading developers, landowners, builders, you know, from Mervac and, and um, friends of mine like Milligan, Milligan Group, Frasers, Dexas. You've got Oliver Hume, Len Lease, Investor, Toga. It goes on and on and on and on. But before, before we get to there, how did you get to there? And, and, and I mean, your business, I, I think from what I understood, it used to be, it used to be sort of digital advertising, marketing, media, and now you talk about it as placemaking. Um, it's a broad question, but kind of how did we get to this point in time? So I started the business just over 30 years ago, and it was a very kind of traditional graphic design business doing branding. And so, you know, in my formative years, uh, my clients almost were entirely fashion brands from Scanlon and Theodore and Bettina Liano and Just Jeans and Esprit. And then I evolved into doing a lot of alcohol work and CUB, Foster CUB was a huge client and we developed the pure blonde idea with them and took that to market. But I created the identity for Triple Jump and the Three Sticks and a whole bunch of kind of pretty well-known identities around Australia and beyond before I really discovered property. And I kind of discovered property partly out of working on projects that were very place-based. Uh, so when I, you know, really got headfirst into property, it, it really was interesting for me because it enabled me to bring a whole bunch of things that were important in my life together. One was the idea of destination. One was the idea of experience. One was, you know, the theme of value. Uh, and actually, you know, creating value for customers as well as value for people who actually were investing or spending money uh, or taking a risk. And the other one, interestingly and probably surprisingly, was philanthropy. So uh, I was on the board of the Big Issue magazine for seven years and I was on the board of a number of other high profile charities. And I did pro bono work for about eight or 10 different pretty big organizations for, well, the last three decades, really. And so, you know, it's been interesting the way that my wife has said to me, you know, a dozen or so years ago, I love the way that your uh, career has dovetailed into not just property development on one side and philanthropy on the other, but this kind of Venn diagram, what sits in the middle is placemaking. This notion that we can actually create these incredible destinations, these purposeful places that actually add value to the community, that actually create opportunity uh, that people see value in, um, but they actually are, uh, you know, evolving to deliver uplift, to deliver higher value, um, you know, deliver experience. But I'm always talking about the, both the social and the economic. So how can I be involved in projects that have a potential to deliver job creation or increased socioeconomic benefits or potential education, while at the same time actually working for developers, asset owners and landlords to increase their profitability, to increase their margin, to decrease their risk. And to decrease risk means not doing the same thing you've always done. The only way you decrease risk is by innovating, is by actually doing things that excite people, that get the market talking and to get buyers wanting to be involved in something to the point they'll pay a premium. That's how you de-risk. 
So, yeah, it's been an interesting evolution of my career. Um, and I'm certainly in a very sweet spot now because not only have I evolved to kind of be lucky enough to be doing the branding and marketing for property developments, uh, but I'm also doing, you know, the placemaking for these huge destinational sort of experiences and, and places that people sort of all talk about as being desirable and having value. And not just in Australia, but actually around Asia Pacific. So it's a great excuse pre-COVID to travel, uh, whether I'm, you know, working on a project or speaking at a conference. Um, but it's also great to kind of get under the skin and to understand the DNA of a place. And that in itself, for me, is one of the most fun things that I'm involved in. It, it, the one thing that kept on pumping, coming to mind when you're talking to me is it feels like you've really distilled this art of Kintsugi when, you know, everything comes together through a Venn diagram and, You've got, as you said, uh, destination, experience, value, and philanthropic uh, ideas when they come together. And, and at that heart, you, you've done that for yourself in the business personally, but it looks like you're also trying to find that space or that core truth in each of the projects that you're working with. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, you almost it almost becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy for the people that get involved where you're all coming together for the shared dream or shared vision for what the project can be. And with all of this energy tied into that, it's like we all move in this direction and create this village or create this desired result. So it's, um, it does feel like a movement that you've created there. Yeah. Well, I think it's kind of really evolved into a philosophy for me. And, you know, I've obviously got my book series called The Place Economy, which we're working to complete the third one at the moment. And they've had a fantastic global following. And it's probably the reason why I do get, I'm lucky enough to speak at all these international conferences is because of that book series. But the thing is that it started out with this idea of purpose and vision. And I don't know about you, but I've worked into a lot of big corporate environments and boardrooms and, and, uh, and reception environments that have their vision on the wall. And I read it and think, man, that sounds so generic. I've read a version of that, you know, 20 times over. I don't see what makes it, you know, individual to this organization. I don't see how that could be a driver for someone who works here to go, I'm so glad I work here because that's the thing that gets me here every morning. And so for me, you know, we talk about purpose as, a, you know, a reason why we choose to exist, like, you know, beyond money, beyond financial gain. And so I always say to people, a purpose is true if it's, if it's, true for both the organization and for me and for the people who work in it. And so when I talk to people about this, you know, I've got, I remind my team that, you know, our purpose is that we believe in visionary thinking because we know it leads to meaningful places. And then from that, it's, it's like, well, how does that, you know, um, come to life as a vision? And so the way that I would articulate that to people, because we see these words all the time and they become a bit meaningless, but the vision is what we'll create in a larger world when we realise our purpose. So the pressure test for that is, will it actually inspire people? Both like people who work in my business and people I talk to, whether it's you or on the street, will people go, wow, yeah, I'm engaged by that. And so at Hoying, you know, we will be the global thought leader in place thinking we will drive change and we'll create recognisable and engaging destinations which realise increased social and economic outcomes. And that is what gets me out of bed every day. It's a powerful vision and purpose to really drive. It's energetic, that's for sure. And with that, how, how, has, this, how has this economic, how has COVID, how has that sort of um, interrupted or how has it... How has it impacted you recently? When, when you know, uh, COVID first hit, you know, Mar well, properly hit March 2020, I was pretty calm. I, maybe I shouldn't have been, but I was thinking, okay, at this point I'd been in business 29 years. I've been through a few cycles. Um, I've made a lot of mistakes. I've learned a few things along the way. And whether it was, you know, the early 90s or whether it was 2000 or whether it was... 2008, um, you know, I went through pretty big dips in revenue or really kind of struggled through it, but got to the other end. So when COVID hit, I was mentally prepared and I thought, okay, I just have to manage through this in a really calm manner because I know that the way that I behave and act will have a huge impact on the people who work at Hoyne. Um, 
And so I wanted to be a really positive influence in that regard. And it wasn't that there wasn't stress because there was. I mean, our, our revenue dropped by 70%, you know, and like, you know, I've probably got a, had a salary bill of like $10 million a year. So that's like, you know, it's a pretty big hit. Um, so probably all of 2020 was pretty tough. Uh, 2021, I thought was going to kind of just bounce back. It didn't. Uh, it took a few months to kind of come good. But look, the interesting thing is that we are we are in great shape as a business. Um, the business is strong. In fact, we probably put 10 extra staff on in the last two or so months. We're probably trying to find another 10. Um, so we are almost back at our full strength that we were, you know, two or so years ago. Um, in some ways, better in some ways stronger and more resilient. And all the other, I've, I'm involved in a number of other business ventures. I'm involved in a couple of property developments that I'm partners in. I'm involved in some funds, um, um, which have only got a handful of people in them. Um, I'm involved in one particular fund, which I find really interesting. It's owning kind of small motels and caravan parks, which has done very well, even with all the lockdowns. Um, I mean, I'm a partner uh, in a brewery called Willie the Boatman. It's just a small oh, brewery yeah. in St. Peter's. And that's, even with all this, it's done really well. So the thing that surprises me is I'm kind of here I am in late 2021 and actually everything I'm involved in is in really good shape. And it certainly didn't feel like that was going to be the case a year ago or maybe even six months ago just for some of them. But um, not only are we in good shape everywhere, but actually the next 18 months looks incredibly bright and vibrant and exciting. And so I'm just, everywhere I look, all I can see is opportunity. And is there a lesson in that? So for us watching, listening and, and paying attention to your story and what's currently happening, what are you seeing and what, what sort of little lessons can we take out of what you're seeing in the market currently? Sure. Um, look, because I work in all areas or sectors of property, um, and I don't want to take up the next three hours of <laughs> this conversation, if I just focus on like residential, because residential is kind of the interesting, sexy bit, and there's so many components to resi, whether we're talking about master plans or towers or, you know, how different house typologies or whatever. And so, you know, there's a lot of really interesting things happening in resi. And right now we're launching projects in Melbourne, Sydney, Canberra, Brisbane, Auckland, um, uh, and maybe Perth too, actually Perth as well. And so we're quite lucky to have an exposure to these, you know, different sectors, um, you know, both in terms of master plans and apartments and, and different price points. But Certainly at the premium price point, it's incredibly strong. I'm, I'm amazed by the, the, you know, Sirius, I think, got up to 120,000 a square metre. You know, 111 Castle Ray was something like 70,000 a square metre. Um, you know, we sold 70% of key in Brisbane with Mervac pretty much at launch, you know, and Brisbane's been a really tough market for 12 years. And in fact, Brisbane, I think, is about to come back in a very strong way, and not just because of the Olympics, but... It's been very depressed for 12 years. So if I'm looking to buy anywhere, and I have actually just bought in Brisbane, um, you know, I'm, a, I'm definitely a very active buyer in the market on an ongoing basis. Uh, and I've felt that the last year, as the market's been so soft, I thought, wow, this is a great time to buy. And I feel over the next six to 12 months, it's just going to get higher and higher. So, um, you know, it's not just the kind of sexy locations like the CBDs, but in Sydney, you know, for example, places like Penrith, I think, still have uh, a huge amount of growth potential. Um, so for me, looking from a, from a buying and a property development point of view and even a marketing point of view, um, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of optimism. And, you know, some of the bigger, larger institutional developers are, you know, looking to launch some very exciting projects, probably not till, you know, 2022 into 2023. But some of the boutique developers we work with who are doing some very sexy, beautiful work with some, you know, architects, they've got stuff coming out now, you know, and into early next year. So there's really a different sort of typologies at different scale, but there's some really progressive thinking in the market right now. And I think COVID has forced people to be more innovative, and that's a fantastic thing. So hopefully we'll see a lot less of your shitty cookie cutter stock um, that's held together by, you know, sticky tape and, and blue tack. 
Um, yeah. You know, because that's the stuff I don't want to be involved in. I've got no desire to work on things that I wouldn't buy, I wouldn't endorse, and I wouldn't put my name to. I think that's incredibly important in your career. So it sounds like to me that you do see a broad vision of optimism in the real estate, residential real estate, and it's Brisbane's on your radar. Uh, you're, you're, you like premium properties. You like the boutique estates. And I want to dive a little bit deeper, but do you see opportunities? It says like you've got opportunities in affordability because you did mention Penrith. And do you have issues with buying in sort of master plan communities or larger estates? No, actually, um, I bought two townhouses in a project that I worked on in uh, outer Melbourne called Woodley, which is a development by Mervac and VIP. And I, I'm just so proud to be associated with that development. I actually think it's probably one of the best master plans in all of Australia. So I almost feel I've got them for a steal. Um, they're beautifully designed townhouses by DKO. And my view is over the next 10 years, they are going to increase in value off the charts. Particularly, you know, since I bought them, you know, some time back, the last year, you know, a lot of property has gone up between 20 and 28% in houses, particularly in houses. So um, I think that for the right master plan, and a lot of them I think are pretty average around Australia, but for the right master plan that has amenity, green space, schools, education, public transport, if you can tick those boxes, you are looking in the right place. Yeah, that's a really good buying or sort of a tick box buying list for getting into master plan communities. And you're right, there are a lot of average developments that do go up and it does sort of dampen the enthusiasm for the industry. But again, like everything, you've got to do your research and you'll find the right investments out there. Which brings me to my next sort of segment that I wanted to chat to you about, which is sort of wealth and mm. what, what wealth means to you. What, what does it mean to you to build a wealthy life? You know, it's funny because when we're thinking about this from a marketing point of view, if we're uh, positioning something at the higher end, people always think about luxury and all these words. For me, it's about time. Like to be wealthy is to have time, is to have time to actually focus on what's important to you. Um, it's about creating your own priorities rather than being dictated to by others about what you need to be doing. You know, that whether it's time with family, time to learn, time to do things, but the time. And I think the other thing is about having, an, you know, wealth for me is about an increasing array of options that you can choose from. And so... And part of that is about being present. You know, it's just about like enjoy yourself in the moment. Don't always think so much so, so forward. Like it's great to look forward to things and it's fantastic to plan for the future, but enjoy now. Be, a, be mentally, you know, engaged in what's happening now. And for me, you know, that's wealth. I did actually read a great quote, and I'll probably get it wrong, um, from actor Will Smith, and it stuck with me for, I've heard it a few times, and it's always stuck with me. And I think it was someone asking him about, hey, you're a pretty wealthy guy now, you know, how has wealth changed your life? And his comment was like, money and success don't change people, they merely amplify what was already there. So if you're a greedy person, you will be way more greedy. If you're a generous person, you'll be way more generous. Whatever was inside you, whatever it was that made you, if you've got wealth, you can just amplify that version of who it is that you are and do it quicker and at greater scale. Mm, I really like that because people have this vision for themselves in this future state where everything's better, they're wealthy, <laughs> they're changed, they're not what they are. But as you've said it, it's who you are today. And then if you've got more wealth, if you've got more time, if you've got more cash, you're just going to be more you, whatever that is. Yeah. You're going to bring out that inner beast, whatever it is. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, let's hope the inner beast is a good one because it'll just yeah. make you better. But if it's not, it'll just make you worse. Uh, we've seen that type of person, but we won't talk about it. Um, I, I want to ask you, so if, if that is your definition of wealth, what's, what's the one thing that, you know, I could do we could do today to make ourselves a little wealthier? Um, look, this might not sound very fun for a lot of people, but I can promise you it's, it's, it's way better than it sounds. Watch less TV. Honestly, watch less TV. If people record it, how much time they spent watching TV when they could be reading a book, 
listening to a podcast, talking to their wife or children, engaging in life. And don't get me wrong, we all get tired. We all need to switch off. We all need to chill. You know, I love watching movies with my wife. It's a great thing to do. But first, watch less TV because most of it is just a waste of your time. Uh, and secondly, get out of bed earlier. Whatever time you get out of bed right now, get up an hour earlier. You'd be amazed what you can do in the morning. I mean, I, people, my friends always joke that I get more done by nine o'clock than most people get done in a whole day. Uh, it might not necessarily be true, but they know that I get up early and I, I do a lot of stuff and I, I'm really well ahead of the game uh, by the time most people wake up. And it's not for everybody, but it's definitely had a huge contribution uh, to all the good things that have happened in my life. They're two great answers. Um, I, I, meet, I recently moved near in Lake Macquarie and I've had some terrible internet service. So I've been watching basically no TV <laughs> and I've been living, you know, that life with the sun. So when the sun goes down, I've just gone to sleep, whatever time that is, and been waking up at the crack of dawn. And I can tell you that I have felt much, much better. And I watch TV, I binge watch, you know, Squid, the Squid Game Show, whatever it is the other night. And I'm like, it was a guilty pleasure. But yeah, I, I fell asleep later, I woke up later, and I was less effective the next day. So it was so funny to see even that changes in my life. And the one thing that, I, that I really resounds with me, and as I always say this to my partner, is you know, I feel like one hour in the morning at the crack of dawn when you're by yourself is worth almost you know, three or four in the afternoon. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree because it's uninterrupted time. I'll be looking at emails late at night and sometimes I just think, I don't, I don't really know how to answer this. My brain's not working. I'll do it in the morning and I'll get up and I'll read it and the answer is obvious and it's simple. It's not even complex, but I'm just so much sharper. And I want to use that time of the day when I am sharpest to make those important decisions and to move things forward. That's, that's really um, good advice. And I suppose, which this all leads me to the next part. And I know that you're we're pressed for time because you're a busy man, <laughs> but I want to just work on this part where it's effectively, I want us to sort of to lean on the network. And I want to just ask you, what is the one thing that we should be coming to you for help? And then the next thing will be, what's the one thing that you need a hand with, whether it's getting your car fixed, renovating your house or whatever <laughs> it is, or maybe something in the business that we can then help you and reach out and offer you a hand. So what's the one thing that you can do to help us? Um, look, for me, the way that I look at, my business and the way that I approach life is that I want to find ways to add value to experience, the people's experience. Now, whether that's someone living in a place, working in a place, or even just visiting a place. So it's about using our kind of place visioning process to come up with unique ideas that are a perfect fit for a location and an audience and a product to differentiate it to make it compelling and to get people excited about living, working or, you know, eating there. So for me, it's just like I'm always looking for great projects that have incredible leaders, developers and other consultants that I can be a part of that team and help kind of collaborate. So one of the most exciting things I think I do in my job is just collaborating and finding ways to add value. Um, in terms of what others can do for me, you know, I've never asked this before, but I'm just, it just kind of came to me then, honestly. So I'm working on my third um, volume of the book, The Place Economy. And um, just to give everyone a bit of an idea of what that is, it's, it's a resource book that I've been working on for about, oh God, I think I launched, started the first one in 2014 and launched it in 2016 and then launched the second one in 2019. And I was going to launch the third one last year, but I've ended up rewriting most of it because the world changed. And so I had to kind of rethink about everything with a COVID lens. But it, it's, a, it's a resource book that has case studies, stories and interviews that kind of uh, illustrate uh, and articulate the categorical link between better placemaking and significantly higher profits that actually, you know, add value to kind of investors but also create economic upswing for communities, residents, people who work there. And, you know, most of all, well-being that people can expect to get from being involved in these places. So 
I'm always looking for examples of great places. Is it a development? Is it a town? Is it somewhere you visited overseas? Where is somewhere that you've been that, and, it, and this is really important, it wasn't necessarily, it might have been a tourist place, that's okay, but it delivered value for locals first and foremost. It delivered benefits for the people who live there and who worked there, who actually kind of felt that this wasn't like somewhere else. It had its own DNA. It actually had uh, attributes that were not directly or easily replicable. Um, that while visitors might have gone there, because the thing about tourism is people want to go where locals love. Tourists don't want to go if they get there and they find out locals hate the joint. It doesn't work. It might be a short termism. And so I'm always looking for great places around the world that might just have fantastic playgrounds or parks or shops or businesses, but they create an incredible local economy where everyone wins. I'm always looking for examples that prove there is a win-win, win-win. It's not about win-lose. It's about win-win. So if I'm hearing you loud and clear, it's that you're looking for places that locals love. So we're going to come to you. And for everybody out there watching, listening, leave comments of places that you love because I want to hear about it. Andrew wants to hear about it. It might show up in his book. Yep. And I think that that's a really good way of thinking about it. When you go to a place that has a, like a, a tactile soul, there's an energy. People can feel that frequency where you get there and you feel happier. People are saying, hey, in the streets, there's, there's something to it. It has its own culture. So I'll, I'll be thinking of, a, of spaces for you and I'll be definitely reaching out. And then for people that need your help, it's people that are after building their own places. You want to collaborate with great developers, builders, landowners, people that are creating spaces. And that's where you're, um, you've got your finely craft uh, set of repertoire and your talents are all there for them. And I think the consistent thing between both themes is it's about creating legacy. You know, I think legacy is not just important for uh, organizations, it's actually important for individuals because as individuals, where the, it's, that's what is an organization is. It's a bunch of people, individuals who have to go home and talk to their partners and their children and, and proudly speak of the contribution that they have made to the livability or the destinational experiences within a community. And so there's a legacy in the place that you deliver and you, you build and you leave, but there's, there's legacy in every component of that and it, it has to be multi-generational. Andrew, thank you very much for this conversation today. Um, I feel wiser and richer for chatting to you, certainly wealthier. <laughs> um, thanks again. And uh, I look forward to jumping on the show with you again and seeing a copy of that book once it's completed. And uh, I hope you have an amazing day. To all of you out there, like, subscribe, reach out, leave comments. If you disagree with us, let us know. And if you love everything we've got here, share it with all your friends. So, Andrew, catch you all later, and I'll see you all next week. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate it.